Where is Bitcoin going this year? Will Ethereum remain the dominant layer one? Could NFTs make a comeback or will regulation strangle all of crypto? All of this was recently covered in an institutional report, a comprehensive and in-depth 2023 market outlook that I found incredibly insightful. So in my video today, I'm going to break down this report into the most important sections and explain what they could mean for the crypto market. I also have a few of my own thoughts on these predictions, so be sure to stick around. The report I'll be summarizing today is one that was drawn up by David Duong, the head of institutional research at Coinbase, with contributions from several of his colleagues. Now, I've covered a number of Coinbase reports from David & Co in the past and have linked to this particular one below. So let's jump right in. Chapter one is on some of the key themes that we're likely to see in 2023. These will be expanded on later in the video, but I'll run through a number of them now. The first theme is on the flight to quality by institutional investors. Quite simply, there was a general retraction of institutional capital from all risk assets in the second half of last year. This wasn't just a crypto-specific phenomenon either, and was based on the fear that we could be heading into a recession, something that many financial participants view as a certainty. This has led to a capital flight to quality assets. In the crypto space, that means the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum. This is on the, quote, sustainable tokenomics, maturity of the respective ecosystems, and relative market liquidity. David & Co. also show us this chart here, which is quite encouraging. It's the long-term holders of Bitcoin and the long-term holder percentage over the years. As you'll see, there are a number of dips that occur in the bear markets as some hodlers are shaken out. However, over the long term, the number keeps increasing. On this page, they go over the ETH narrative. More specifically, given that there are a number of alternative layer ones on the market right now, can Ethereum retain its dominant position? Despite the prevailing market conditions, 2022 was a big year for Ethereum, and that's because of its move to proof of stake. Looking forward, though, we can expect developer consolidation to continue as they coalesce around a smaller number of chains in 2023. However, Despite the potential for competing chains in 2023, the authors think that Ethereum is likely to remain dominant thanks to Layer 2 scaling solutions. Indeed, in the case of Polygon, for example, these Layer 2 solutions are actively poaching developers from ecosystems like Solana's. Then there's the growth of decentralized finance and decentralized exchanges. This is only likely to accelerate in the new year as the industry has become incredibly jaded by centralized exchanges and lending firms that have lost billions of dollars in value. This doesn't mean that there won't be challenges for DeFi, of course. Hacks and exploits are still commonplace, and a lot of the DEXs that do operate can't margin accounts correctly given the extreme volatility of some of these tokens. Now, onto this page over here, and that's on, quote, permissioned DeFi, an oxymoron if you ask me. If it's permissioned, well then, it ain't DeFi, just saying. Anyway, David & Co argue that as risk-free yields start to pick up in TradFi, the yield uplift we see in DeFi protocols is no longer that appealing. Hence, the fall in TVL that we can see in this chart over here. However, they think it could be an opportunity for those dApps adapting to a more permissioned or enhanced version of DeFi that has regulations. Despite how much we may be against the notion of any sort of permission DeFi, they do make a fair point. And that is that it could allow for the inclusion of tokenized real-world assets within DeFi, as well as solving other problems related to credit scores like undercollateralized lending. And speaking of real-world asset tokenization, the authors point out that this could be a relatively risk-free way for institutions to gain crypto exposure in some form. Essentially, tokenize a TradFi asset and trade it on a blockchain. Now, while this has been slow out of the gates, last year did see French bank Société Générale 
issue tokens that were based on AAA-rated French home loans. This could be used as collateral to borrow up to 30 million DAI. However, the authors think that it will take quite some time before we see tokenization of non-financial assets on the blockchain. This next section here is on, quote, areas for creative destruction, that good old capitalist cleanse of shitcoinery. Jokes aside, the authors point out that investors' willingness to accumulate altcoins this year has been severely impacted by last year's deleveraging. They say that many of these newer projects may have been hit particularly hard as they loaned out their tokens to market makers who'd used FTX as a liquidity pool. Hence, it's going to be a long old wait for the bankruptcy process to conclude and for these projects to get their money back. Given how long it could take, I wouldn't expect many of them to still be standing by the end of it. Moving on, this interesting chart here shows the relative sector flows from different altcoins. As you can see, it's relatively even in terms of buys and sells, although it looks as if liquid staking projects are seeing large inflows. And if you've seen the performance of Lido Finance's TVL into the new year, you'll appreciate that as well. Now, moving on from altcoins, this page talks about those marginal Bitcoin miners. It's been a rough old year for them as well. As the report points out, miners have been liquidating coins faster than they can mine them. Data from a report by Glassnode last year shows that they'd been selling about 135% of the mined coins on a daily basis. This is as a combination of not only the lower Bitcoin price, but also the added costs required to mine, increased difficulty with higher energy prices. The result has been a number of bankruptcies, with both Core Scientific and Compute North filing last year. Should this trend persist, the report foresees more marginal miners eventually throwing in the towel or being acquired by better capitalized competitors. On to this next page over here, however, which talks about potential new use cases for NFTs. Now, while it's clear that demand for NFTs is currently in the toilet, David & Co. seem to think that we are still super early. More specifically, the fundamental characteristic of NFTs, unique and immutable ownership representation, has not changed. As a result, there could be a widening of scope to a number of different NFTs that focus on utility. So, in other words, there could be a shift from the current narrative, art-based NFTs, to those that are focused on digital identity, ticketing, memberships or subscriptions, as well as supply chain management and the tokenization of real-world assets. The final section of Chapter 1 is on foundational reforms to the crypto space, or more specifically, regulatory reforms. David & Co. think that the next market cycle could be shaped by significant regulatory standards and frameworks. He states that, quote, Clear guidance is necessary to avoid driving innovation to regions where regulatory requirements are weaker and customers may be at greater risk. Now, I tend to agree here. Part of the reason why an exchange like FTX, which wasn't based in the US, was able to get so many users was because these users were driven away from US shores where there weren't any clear regulatory frameworks. The report is particularly optimistic about certain legislation, including the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act, DCCPA, which would allow the CFTC to have oversight of digital assets, something that I actually think most of us would prefer, anything to get crypto regulations away from the grasp of a certain Gary Gensler at the SEC. Whatever laws are put into place by the regulators, it's important that they realize that what has happened over the past year has absolutely nothing to do with the technology and everything to do with the reckless and fraudulent centralized entities. What will be needed first and foremost is a reform of centralized lending practices. The 3AC and Celsius collapses led to a cascade of similar falls for the likes of Voyager and BlockFi. Indeed, I don't think that we've seen the end of it, given that the pioneer of daisy chain lending, Genesis, now also appears to be headed for bankruptcy. David & Co. also expect to see a maturation of lending practices, including, quote, underwriting standards, appropriate collateralization, and asset stroke liability management. 
Given that retail got so badly burned by the collapse of these lending firms, they reckon that the majority of the inventory for crypto lending in 2023 will come from institutional capital. They believe that this could take a few months, although I happen to think that this timeline is being optimistic given the bloodbath that institutions have also had to endure. Speaking of which, the report does see a path to more institutional adoption in 2023. Despite the increased volatility in 2022, there was a slow grind of adoption. Moreover, according to an institutional survey that Coinbase conducted last year, the majority of these institutions still think that crypto is here to stay, despite the challenges it faces. Now, with all that said, David and co believe that we need to see an actual bottoming of not just the crypto market, but also TradFi markets before we can see that rush of institutional capital coming back. Now, this page finishes off over here with some additional stats from that Coinbase survey last year, specifically as they relate to price predictions. Over 50% thought that prices would remain range-bound over the next 12 months. The important caveat here is that this survey was conducted just before the FTX collapse, so I think that the results would be quite different today. And this perfectly tees up the second chapter of the report, which is all about Bitcoin. This chart over here gives a high-level overview of Bitcoin's price overlaid with many of the most important news stories and developments, color-coded if they're bullish or bearish. Something they do point out, which I think many of us don't really appreciate, is just how resilient Bitcoin has been in the face of the broader CeFi collapse. I'll also remind you that unlike in the great financial crisis, there was no taxpayer-funded bailout. Moreover, despite bankruptcy after bankruptcy, the Bitcoin network still continued to work as intended. 255,000 transactions per day in 2022, despite the incredibly volatile conditions. The report's authors also say that from a macro perspective, the value proposition of Bitcoin has only improved. Think about the collapse witnessed in certain sovereign currencies as a result of completely boneheaded monetary policies. Here you have the charts of Bitcoin's risk-adjusted returns compared to the likes of the Japanese yen and the euro. What it shows is that BTC USD mirrored those of euro USD, producing gains when the euro sold off. Moreover, in 2022, when most G10 FX pairs were collapsing versus the dollar, Bitcoin appeared to outperform relative to the others on the downside. However, the important caveat here is that it excluded some choice periods such as May, June and November, so I would take that with a pinch of salt. Over here, meanwhile, David & Co. take a look at the current bear market and compare it to previous ones. This chart shows the percentage of Bitcoin holders that are currently underwater. This is nearing 50%, which is just below historical high points in previous bear cycles of 2015 and 2019. These have been turning points for Bitcoin and have signaled the bottom of those cycles. Or more specifically, this is the zone of max pain. However, from a fundamental perspective, the Bitcoin network has advanced considerably since then. For example, the Lightning Network channel is near all-time highs in terms of value locked, and despite the collapse in prices, institutional adoption is still miles ahead of where it was in previous cycles. On this page, meanwhile, they expand on the current miner landscape. There's no doubt that it's been a tough year, especially for those miners that took out a great deal of leverage on their balance sheets in the good times. In many cases, this was collateralized against their mining machines, which have also been collapsing in value. As a result, these miners have had to offload Bitcoin inventory at a rapid pace. You can see that in this chart over here with data from the public miners, about 23% of the total. It's no coincidence that those that have been the most aggressive with the selling, such as Core Scientific, have been in the most trouble. As more miners switched off those machines, the hash rate continued to drop. In December of last year, we saw the largest hash rate fall since July 2021. And things could get even worse for the miners this year, however. This is especially the case for those with debt as higher interest rates start to bite. If Bitcoin remains range-bound, 
then the debt servicing cost could eventually make normal operations unfeasible. The authors expect to see further consolidation in the minor space this year. Those with stronger balance sheets and more sustainable earnings will embark on the acquisition of weaker ones. It's not all doom and gloom in the mining space, however. Outside of the US, there are sparks of light, including in Russia, where they've been building up mining capacity, and China, where despite the ban, miners are still operating. This just goes to show that miners will gravitate to where there is cheap energy. Over here, meanwhile, the report talks about those infamous Mount Gox disbursements, and you may have heard me mention this as a potential risk for 2023. Quite simply, in Q4 of last year, the trustee agreed to disperse over 141,000 Bitcoin. While some think that this could lead to additional selling pressure this year, it's far from clear-cut. That's because of a few factors. Firstly, many of the claims were bought up by hedge funds and other private equity firms. They were done as investments, which means that most of the motivated sellers have already sold their claims and won't be dumping their Bitcoin onto the market. Second, there are creditors in the chain who opted not to take earlier payment from the trustee in their position. Further proof that these are not desperate sellers looking to get out of their positions. And finally, it's worth also noting that the trustee has said that these disbursements would be restricted, quote, until all or part of the repayments made as initial repayments is completed. So this basically means that they won't all be made at once, and hence, if there is any selling pressure, it won't come all in one fell swoop. Now, on that final point, I'll also add that last week, the date for disbursements was pushed further back by the trustee. So there's a good chance that the Mt. Gox theory is just FUD. So let's move on to the next chapter, which is all about Ethereum. Now, similar to the earlier Bitcoin chart, the authors have a chart over here that maps the price of ETH with all the events of last year. One of the biggest events for Ethereum last year was, of course, the merge. Indeed, this was perhaps the most important event for Ethereum since its launch. The fact that it was completed thanks to the collective efforts of the Ethereum community and no central authority is pretty remarkable. Now, over here, David and co. talk about Ethereum's on-chain activity. Although there's been a slight decline in said activity, this has been nothing compared to the collapses seen on other Layer 1s. The authors also point out that the prospect for a long-term deflationary ETH is quite likely given that small bursts of activity in October and November were enough to drive it into deflation. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, of course. There has been a reduction in the transaction fee component of the staking rewards. With that being said, they do mention that there is still currently a low staking percentage, which is keeping overall rewards relatively high. However, this could change considerably with the release of the Shanghai fork later this year. As you know, the higher the percentage staked, the lower the rewards. And speaking of the Shanghai update, there is still no firm deadline on when we could see it being rolled out. This is acting as an impediment for some of those aforementioned investors who would like the opportunity to stake without the lockups. On the flip side, there are many concerned about the potential selling impact that could come from unstaked ETH hitting the market. However, as the authors of the report point out, there would be rate-limited withdrawals that would limit the total amount of ETH unstaked per epoch. Now, I've talked about this in much more detail in my video on the merge, which I'll leave in the description for you folks. The TLDR is that the amount of withdrawals won't be significant enough to constitute a dump. And even then, they won't be processed according to order of requests, but rather other unique and permanent identifiers. Moreover, there could be additional demand to stake as the staking reward increases as a result of the withdrawals, lower overall percentage staked. Likely more FUD, and not something I'm all that worried about. Now, this next page is all about the efforts that have been made to keep the network censorship resistant. I won't go into them in too much detail, but I will say that there are plenty of challenges on this front. Although open source code like Flashbots has got around the question of centralization on the miner slash validator level, the OFAC sanctions of Tornado Cash 
threw up the biggest challenges yet. Validators don't want to risk sanctions violation. And since the Tornado Cash sanctions, almost 70% of the blocks propagated are OFAC compliant. Not ideal. Anywho, this here is particularly interesting. It looks at new income streams that could be available to stakers through restaking. Essentially, this would show those who have staked their ETH in the main staking contract to also restake it in middleware tech that generates them additional returns. This is currently being facilitated through companies like Obol and Eigenlayer, which are looking to leverage Ethereum's base layer security to build out these middleware solutions. This could be an additional opportunity for 2023, although I will say that this is still in its initial stages and is not battle-tested enough. I'll leave links to some additional resources on Eigenlayer in the description for you guys. OK, on to the next chapter, and this is on the broader Layer 1 and Layer 2 landscape. This is an overview of other ecosystems and blockchains. It appears as if the market has become quite saturated as a number of L1s and 2s have eaten into Ethereum's market share. In mid-2021, Ethereum had about 70% of the TVL on the market, and this fell to 57% by December of the same year. However, Ethereum has maintained almost exactly the same TVL percentage from then to November of last year. The same can be said of BSC, which had the same TVL at the end of last year as it had at the end of 2021. In terms of other notable moves, Terra has completely fallen out of the charts, for obvious reasons, of course, whereas Avalanche has also taken a tumble down the rankings. I'm also surprised to see the resurgence in Tron's TVL, as it's just behind BSC for now. Now, another really interesting way to compare these alternative L1s and 2s is to look at their market caps as a percentage of Ethereum's. As you can see, the one that has gained the most is BNB, which went from around 20% to over 30%. However, it's been less favorable for some of the other blue chips, such as Solana and Avalanche. Solana has been particularly badly hit following the implosion of FTX. More about that in the description. Now, something that the authors also note is the fact that the transaction volumes on these different chains don't appear to move in tandem. They vary by chain, which therefore suggests that developers and users oscillate to the networks where they get the most scaling benefits. They don't have to sit around and accept the status quo. The report also asks the broader question of whether we'll see a winner-takes-all situation playing out in the Layer 1s and Layer 2s. I don't happen to think so, but, well, maybe that's just me. Here, meanwhile, the authors talk about the FAT protocol theory versus the FAT application theory. It's quite thought-provoking if you're an ardent follower of the former. Now, I've talked about the FAT protocol theory a number of times in some of my older ETH videos. Basically, with the FAT protocol theory, the notion is that value will accrue to the protocol layer. Whereas Coinbase says that as user adoption grows, we should appreciate the FAT application thesis. Namely, that application value can surpass the value of the network which it's built on. Therefore, one should focus on the growth rate of dApps on the network rather than on the growth of the network itself. So, where are we seeing most dApps being built today? Those networks are the ones to watch. Moving on, though, and the next chapter is all about stablecoins. Now, there's no doubt that the growth of stablecoins has been unprecedented over the past two years. If you look at this chart, you can see stablecoin dominance as it went from near 4% two years ago to close to 14% at the end of last year. The authors think that this is bullish for the market. That's not only because the participants holding the stables are, quote, digitally native, but also because it means that this capital is in dry powder and is ready to be deployed again at some point. If we break down the stablecoin volumes, it's no surprise that fiat-backed stables are in the majority. Clearly, the collapse of UST set the decentralized stablecoin dream back a number of years. The two biggest centralized stablecoins in that bucket are, of course, USDT and USDC. Both are highly liquid, and have extensive exchange support. They're similar in lots of ways, except for one, and that is the composition of their reserves. USDC 
is backed by a combination of cash and US treasuries. You can see how that composition has evolved over the last year. Tether, on the other hand, is still considered to be a black box. Unlike USDC issuer Circle, Tether has never done a full audit, although it has completed what are called attestations. That aside, these attestations have been showing some promising improvements. More particularly, Tether has been actively diversifying away from that infamous commercial paper into treasury bills and other assets. In November of last year, it held almost 82% of its assets in these highly liquid T-bills. Will this really quell market suspicion? Well, perhaps, but until Tether completes a full audit of those reserves, I think the questions will always linger. Now, on this page, the report talks about stablecoin potential as a, quote, killer app. There's no doubt that stablecoins can really help to power mass adoption of cryptocurrencies in online payments and commerce. Instantaneous settlement and low fees cannot be taken for granted. It's something you can only really appreciate if you've used TradFi as a merchant or tried to send money overseas as a regular individual. Now, David and co. also talk about the work that's been done on other forms of stablecoins. For example, Curve has released plans for a stablecoin where the collateral will automatically vary depending on the price performance of said collateral. It's called a Lending Liquidating AMM Algorithm, or LAMA, and I'll leave information about it in the description for you guys. They also talk about Aave's new design for an over-collateralized stablecoin called Go. I covered that in my latest Aave review, which will also be in the usual spot. There's also progress on the regulatory front for fiat-backed stablecoins, and the new chair of the House Financial Services Committee is keen to pick it up this year. The details are still being ironed out, but as well as non-banks such as Circle, it'll also enable regular banks to become stablecoin issuers. OK, so that's stablecoins, definitely an area that's going to continue seeing growth this year. Let's turn the page to the next chapter, though, which is all about NFTs. As I mentioned earlier in the video, too much of the focus has been on PFP NFTs and not enough on the broader use cases that they could serve. I'm not throwing shade at the art and collectible movement. They brought awareness of NFTs to the mainstream, and they also served as a strong springboard for a lot of otherwise normie no-coiners being onboarded to the Web3 space. They also reinforced the notion of unique digital property rights, something which we didn't really have before. But they have led to a flood of competition, which has caused some serious oversaturation. This, combined with a collapse in trading volumes on these marketplaces, has further led to an unfortunate sense of apathy in the NFT space. Only certain blue-chip collections, such as the punks, have managed to maintain their ETH floor prices to some degree. Now, of course, the dollar floor has fallen in line with the collapse in crypto prices. Be that as it may, the focus on collectibles and art should instead be pointed towards the unbelievable utility that comes from more general NFTs. To quote the authors, As the world continues to shift towards the digital realm, NFTs will be a critical component of the infrastructure that allows ownership and identity to function in a frictionless environment. It's also not as if these use cases are mere pipe dreams. The next wave of adoption could already have begun. The authors take us through a few examples over here. Starbucks's NFT loyalty program. Adidas pairing NFTs with physical items. The New York Knicks offering NFTs to ticket holders. Reddit's avatar NFTs. Tiffany & Co's 250 digital passes that could be used by punk holders to buy crypto-themed jewelry. Now, this trend of corporate adoption of NFTs is something that I talked about in my video on crypto predictions for 2023, and I've linked to that in the description for you. But the TLDR is that with the proliferation of layer twos like Polygon, etc., corporate adoption of NFTs is only going to continue in the new year. Meanwhile, another utility NFT category that David and Co. touch on are those ENS or blockchain domains. These are an amazing use case for NFTs, not only because they represent a personal wallet address, but also because blockchain domains are the next frontier of a decentralized web. This is the reason that ENS, Ethereum Name Service Registrations, 
were off the chain <clears throat> last year. Anyways, they also touch on NFTs in the gaming space. Now, this is generally quite a contentious one, as if you know any gamers, many are vehemently anti-crypto and anti-NFTs. Although, to be fair, if you've seen some of the blockchain native games out there, well, you can't really blame them. That's why I tend to think that we could see NFT adoption taking off in gaming when integrated into a really popular traditional game. As long as this won't impact on the gameplay and the gamers themselves can appreciate the benefits of the immutable ownership, then the potential is most certainly there. Over here, meanwhile, the authors talk about the concept of enforcing royalties with NFTs. As you'll probably know, NFTs would allow creators to get royalties for every transaction that takes place on a marketplace. However, capturing these royalties when the assets are traded off the marketplace or on those marketplaces that don't enforce them is a lot harder. OpenSea has been steadfast in its pledge to enforce those creator royalties, as this is one of the primary ways in which these creators can be rewarded for their work in the long term. However, this does mean that they're losing market share to other marketplaces like LooksRare or X2Y2. This avoidance of fees and royalties is something that the authors think we will continue seeing this year. Most traders in the NFT market are profit-driven, and the moment that you add costs to their bottom line, they can easily migrate elsewhere, especially with an asset that can be transferred away from the marketplace as easily as an NFT. However, it's not a favorable outcome for the marketplace, given that without the creators, well, you wouldn't have the NFTs. That's why the authors stand with the decision taken by OpenSea to enforce those royalties, something that I agree with too. Let's hope that the fall in trading volume won't force OpenSea to abandon the policy. Okay, on to the final, yes, final chapter, and that is on everyone's favorite topic, regulation. Yeah, there's no doubt that recent events in the crypto space have provided regulators and legislators with new impetus to take action. However, as the authors point out, many of the failures that took place in 2022 were not because of crypto, but because of the nature in which these firms operated their businesses. They quote, share certain commonalities like undue leverage, insufficient risk controls, and in some cases, unethical business practices. This is something that happens in TradFi all the time, despite all the stringent regulations that exist. But because it's not the new and exciting world of crypto, it doesn't get the same attention. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we don't need some regulations. We do, just as long as they're reasonable and well-structured. Quote, Appropriately tailored regulatory standards are needed to build a workable framework for the crypto economy that appropriately mitigates risk while enabling the development and adoption of digital innovation for the broader benefit of society. Quite simply, guidelines are important. As long as developers and projects know the rules of the road, they can adjust to keep in their lanes. But it can't be a shifting of the goalposts. Now, when it comes to regulatory clarity in the US, the authors think that we are at an inflection point. There was a lot of movement last year that laid the groundwork for this. For example, in March, President Biden issued the executive order focused on cryptocurrencies. If you'll recall, this was the one that asked US regulatory agencies to come up with a number of proposals around crypto regulations and frameworks. Some of these were helpful, like the Treasury Department's reports on crypto payments. Others were light on specifics and seemed to continue the status quo. However, one of the most important outstanding regulatory issues today is how to really classify a digital asset. Is it a commodity or a security? Because this will determine which agency gets to regulate it, the CFTC or the SEC. Now, while Bitcoin has clearly been defined as a commodity, there are still open questions as to whether ETH is. In the past, it's been claimed that Ethereum is, quote, sufficiently decentralized. However, with the onset of proof-of-stake Ethereum, Gary Gensler created further ambiguity in a hearing that he took part in last year. Now, this broader question around how you would define the asset is important because of that DCCPA bill that I talked about earlier. 
With that, crypto oversight would be in the hands of the CFTC, which is preferable. I've talked about the bill in much more detail, and the video for that will be in the usual spot. There were two main problems with this bill, though. One was that it left many open questions for DeFi regulations, and the other was that a major proponent of it was a certain Sam Bankman-Fried. So, I think it will be a tough job now to get any politicians to pick up a bill attached to such a persona non grata. Now here, David and co talk about a particularly concerning case that the SEC has embarked upon, and that was the actions it took against an influencer for undisclosed incentives in a 2018 ICO. The main point is that they seem to think that the sale of the tokens took place on US soil because the majority of the nodes are US-based. That is a scary precedent to try and set, as it would mean that the SEC could take regulatory jurisdiction over the entire Ethereum network. However, it's also fair to say that validators can be spun up anywhere in the world. So, if the SEC were ever to set a precedent here, those validators could move to other countries that don't come with this overreach. Now, these next few pages go over some of the other global regulations. I won't go into too much detail, but here are some of the most interesting regulatory developments we could see. In Europe, there's the MICA bill. Now, I was actually surprised at how even-handed these regulations are, and it will give more clarity to those crypto companies based in the EU. I'll link to the video I did on MICA in the description. In the UK, meanwhile, new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is relatively pro-crypto, and the Financial Services and Markets Bill, FSMB, is working its way through Parliament. Then, in Switzerland, the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, FINMA, has classified crypto as a distinct asset class, similar to property or hard metals, i.e. not a security. Over here in the UAE, they have the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, VARA, that's looking to develop crypto frameworks. They announced guidelines for this in August of last year, which we hope will give clarity to all the businesses that operate in the region. In Africa, according to the IMF at least, 25% of the countries on the continent regulate crypto in some form. Unfortunately, though, there are six countries that have banned it entirely. Not surprisingly, it's in those countries where it's needed most. In Australia, crypto firms have to register under Austrac's AML and KYC regime. They also have to acquire a license from ASIC, their security regulator. There are also other initiatives underway to appropriately regulate digital assets. And of course, the Reserve Bank is interested in some form of CBDC, so trials could begin soon. And speaking of socialist countries with dystopian tech, China has some of the strictest rules around cryptocurrency. As you'll recall, it banned crypto itself, as well as mining, on a number of occasions. However, Hong Kong could be making some positive moves. That's because the city-state is considering allowing retail trading of digital assets and establishing a regulatory framework. This could be a great entrepot for those Chinese citizens to get into crypto. In India, a country that has a hot and cold relationship with crypto, things remain very much up in the air. The latest development is the Cryptocurrency and Regulation of Official Digital Currency Bill. This will aim to distinguish various different digital currencies and establish frameworks for them. I'll also have you note that India will be hosting the G20 in 2023, and crypto is actually on the agenda. That could be very interesting. In Japan, the Financial Services Agency has deemed crypto legal property, while the Payment Services Act was proposed to create a holistic regulatory framework for payment providers and services that use crypto. Singapore has been an organic hub for digital asset innovation, although it did take a knock last year. Let's not forget that the Lunar Foundation Guard, 3AC, Hoddlenaut, etc. were based out of the country. As a result, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MAS, is looking to broaden the guardrails for retail traders. They've also issued guidance against the advertising of certain crypto services. And finally, there's Thailand, which hasn't been the most crypto-friendly country in general there have been some pretty unfavorable taxes leveled, including on capital gains, although the more onerous terms have been relaxed. 
Well, that's about it for Coinbase's report. If you're still here, then congratulations. I know it was a lot to take in, but there was some really insightful information there that I think we could all benefit from. So, time for a few of my final thoughts. There's no doubt that we still face numerous challenges in the coming months. There remain a number of high-profile, over-leveraged players in the market that have not yet been flushed out. There are still marginal miners who are near capitulation point. We need to see these gremlins worked out of the system before any meaningful recovery can get underway. It's also worth reminding ourselves that the current macro backdrop is really, for lack of a better term, shite. War, inflation, recession. It's not the best environment for allocation to risk assets. However, it's reports like this that help to give me the perspective required to view the glass as half full. Fundamentals remain strong for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. They will be the stalwarts of the crypto space and are still likely to see further institutional adoption, albeit at a reduced rate. DeFi adoption is likely to continue, and the growth rate of stablecoins could help to further its use cases. Yes, there will be challenges to censorship resistance, but the broader community can push through. The same can be said for scaling solutions that help to make it a truly permissionless and inclusive financial ecosystem for all. While other Layer 1s and Layer 2s will struggle, this process of creative destruction is needed. The strong will survive and they will come out the other end more resilient than ever before. Bear markets, after all, are pressure cookers that meld the finest metal. I also think that the NFT sector has been broadly misunderstood. While focus has mostly been on monkey JPEGs, the underlying use cases for this revolutionary tech just cannot be overstated. That's why you should actively be doing your own research on NFT use cases and looking into projects that want to use them in unique yet revolutionary ways. When it comes to regulation, it's clear that it's coming. Billions of dollars of retail money was lost last year, and those politicians need to look as if they're justifying their six-figure salaries. It didn't help that some of them were caught accepting SBF's bribes, I mean donations, last year. Of course, given all the dysfunction and general antics in Washington, it seems unlikely that they could really get regulations together that could be that punitive. In the meantime, the community has the time and the foresight to gather our forces and oppose the most punitive legislation and regulation when it comes. So, in conclusion, 2023 is going to be a rough year, but beyond the gauntlet of fire lies a bull market ready to take us back to the moon. So, keep calm and hodl on. And that's it for my video today, guys. But where do you think we could go in 2023? Price predictions for Bitcoin and ETH? I'd love to know in the comments below. And while you're down there, you may also want to check out my deals page. It's over here where I have some of the best promos and discounts in the crypto space, exclusively for the viewers of this channel. And finally, give me a like and subscribe on the way out. Okay, that's it. I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you.